Hey friends, Elisa Childers here. Have you ever been reading through your Bible and it seems like God is just a little bit more angry, a little bit more wrathful in the Old Testament than he is when we find him incarnate in Jesus in the New Testament? We're going to talk about why that is and how to make sense of it with a special guest on today's podcast. Happy New Year, everybody. It is so great to be back podcasting. I look forward to getting back blogging as well. It's been a long time since I've blogged because, uh, as many of you know, I've been working on a book with Tyndale, and I have turned the entire manuscript in, and we are currently in the editing process, which turns out I love. I did not dream I would love the editing process as much as I do, but I have a great editing team, um, just very sharp, very smart people that I'm so blessed to be working with. And so be praying for me and for our team as we finish up that book, as it's shaping up. It's really my prayer that this book is going to be a great resource to help people who are going through maybe a bit of that deconstruction process, but to help them with their reconstruction, because it's really the story of my reconstruction. And, uh, and so I, I really pray that that will help a lot of people be looking for that in fall of 2020. In the meantime, now that the entire book is turned in and I'm not just completely bogged down with writing it, I'll be able to get back to blogging and also these first few podcasts of the new year that I have lined up for you, I'm really excited to bring you. We're going to be talking with Krista Bontrager, who's a great apologist, who has recently just done a ton of research into MOPS. And if you're not familiar, MOPS is Moms of Preschoolers. They have big conferences. They've got uh, chapters in many churches all around. And we've been hearing kind of smatterings that MOPS might be heading in a progressive Christian direction. And so Krista has done a ton of research. She's going to bring that research to the podcast. We're going to talk about it and bring all that to you. Uh, I've got Richard Howe coming on the podcast, who is a philosophy professor at Southern Evangelical Seminary, just a delightful guy. I adore him and his wife, Rebecca. And he's going to talk with us about how important it is to do good philosophy when we're doing theology. A lot of people don't realize how much those two things go hand in hand. In fact, philosophy is often called the handmaiden of theology, because if you're not thinking right, if you're not using good philosophy to analyze the arguments and things, then you're going to land on some wonky conclusions and things like that. So we're going to talk about that with Richard Howe. I'm going to talk with Seth and Nerva of the Free Mind podcast. Some of you will have heard my guest spots on their podcast, but they're going to come on my podcast this time. And we are going to talk about the episode on the Jen Hatmaker podcast in which she had Nadia Boltz Weber on, and we're going to analyze it and we're going to talk about it. Got lots of great things coming down the pike. I'm going to bring you more analysis of the progressive Christian movement, uh, more analysis of the thought processes behind it, what they're teaching, uh, what they're advocating for. And uh, so I'm just praying this is going to be a great year. Well, I'm thrilled to welcome my guest today, Jeannie Jones, who is the co-author of, so far, a three-part Bible study series, the first Discovering Hope in the Psalms, and then followed up by Discovering Joy in Philippians, and then her newest work, Discovering Jesus in the Old Testament. She blogs at JeannieJones.net. Uh, Jean is a member of Women in Apologetics. In fact, at the conference this year in January, she is going to be a keynote speaker at the third annual Women in Apologetics conference there uh, at Biola in La Mirada, California. So that's January 24th and 25th. Uh, so definitely check that out if you're in the area. So Jean is happily married to her high school sweetheart, Clay, who has also been on the show to talk about his book, Why Does God Allow Evil? And he is a, an associate professor of Christian Apologetics at Talbot Seminary, and they live in Laguna Nigel, California. Roughing it over there in Laguna Nigel, I see. <laughs> it's such a beautiful place. But Jeannie, I'm so glad to have you on the show today uh, to talk about what I think is an important Bible study, especially for the times that we live in. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be here with you. Yes. Well, as our listeners may remember, you came on uh, about a year ago or so to talk about the study that you wrote or co-wrote uh, called Discovering Joy in the Psalms. And 
you, it was so, I loved that episode because you really helped our listeners and, and helped, I think, people in general to understand how to read the Psalms. What are the Psalms for? They teach us how to pray. That was my big takeaway is the Psalms teach us how to pray. And you gave great examples on that and even wove in some good apologetics about, uh, verses that skeptics will sometimes interact with and and bring objections against. And so this newest study is, I think, really important because I think, A, we're at a time in history where biblical illiteracy is at an all-time high. So we have Christians all over the place who don't read the Bible. They don't know the Bible. Uh, They don't know what's in it, but they also don't really understand how it all fits together and how to read it. And so uh, finding Jesus in the Old Testament is the way to understand the Old Testament. And so uh, I've been thrilled as I've been working my way through it. But what was it that made you want to write this book? What was the the inspiration to to just pull the trigger on a book about Jesus in the Old Testament? Biblical illiteracy, as you said it. In fact, I was noticing more and more that there are women coming to Christ as adults, and they've never read the Bible. They haven't attended church. They've heard what atheists say about the God of the Old Testament being mean, and they've believed it, not realizing that that actually comes from atheism. I was visiting a women's group at another church one day, and uh, they were going through a Bible study, and we're touching on something in the Old Testament, And somebody said, I don't understand why God would do this, why he was so mean to Moses. It it just really shakes me. I I don't understand. And I guess it's just that the God of the Old Testament is me. And I uh, put my finger up and to say that I wanted to address that because I was just a visitor. And the group leader said, well, we're out of time, but... I just wanted to say, I've heard the same thing, that the God of the Old Testament is me, but but Jesus in the New Testament is love. And I was just flabbergasted. I said, "Uh, God is never changing, and he's always been a God of love. And I was able to get the gal's email and write her and explain what was going on in the passage that she uh, was was concerned about. She just thanked me. And I just you know, there we need to have some kind of book out there where people see that God put forth his plan to bring Jesus and to bring humans to be with him uh, before he created the world. This, he, it, there is not a God of the Old Testament who's separate from and different from uh, the God of the New Testament. And God always has been a God of love. So that's why I wanted to, to, to do it. Well, and you mentioned the objections that are often brought about by atheists, but of course, in my realm and the, the world that I'm living in, this is a huge objection brought about by progressive Christians as well. In fact, both of the the objections against the God of the Old Testament sort of echo an ancient heresy called uh, Marcionism, where Marcion believed that actually it was an it was a different actual entity, a different God in the Old Testament than the New Testament that redeemed the God of the Old Testament. And of course, I don't think progressive Christians are taking it quite that far. But what I often hear is that what you find in the Old Testament is the best understanding of ancient Israel, the the best way they could relate with God. They're looking at their cultures all around them and they're seeing all of these cultures sacrificed to their gods and you got to appease the gods because the gods are always angry. And so somehow that made its way into uh, the story of the Bible that we have that represents the Old Testament. Then of course, what they will say often is that what we see in Jesus is, is the correction of that. We see what Jesus brings as a redemption of the, the God of the Old Testament. And in a way, kind of saying what Jesus said disagrees with that God. So, so what you're doing with this Bible study is so important. And what I love about it too, because it follows the format of your uh, previous two studies in that, ladies, if you're listening, this is not just a boring, stuffy, scholarly book that you're going to just have to force yourself to read. This is actually a workbook that has um, space for creative expression, uh, where you, a lot of, I've seen so many examples on Facebook of of women using uh, paints and pens and color pencils and, and filling in some of these these pictures and bringing some of these scriptures to life. And so there's, there's a real creative application as well. And um, so, so back to the Old Testament, why do you think that it's so hard for people to understand the Old Testament? Is it the culture we live in? Is it just that we've heard so many things from skeptical sources? Why do you think that is? 
I think it's mostly that uh, the difference in cultures. There, there were things going on in that world that aren't going on today. Today, we understand that um, earthquakes and uh, and uh, lack of rain and etc. are due to natural forces. Whereas in those days, they thought everything was being run by by gods that didn't care for humans and they were fickle and you had to do something to get their their attention because they they just uh, couldn't care less what happened to humans so that's that's one of the big things that the cultural dis, uh, differences another problem is the that people don't understand the history a lot of the authors assumed their readers would know this king was at this time this king was at that time etc and so they would just list off things, and they didn't necessarily write in chronological order. Instead, they would give the names of the kings, thinking that way my readers will know what order I'm going, and they'll know that I've just gone back to this time period. But today, we don't know who those people are uh, in general, and so we we have a lot of trouble um, understanding how everything fits together. And the histories are sometimes in certain places grouped chronologically, especially, or non-chronologically, like uh, Ezra, it's not fully um, chronological. And the major prophets are not chronological. And so that that's that's another issue. After all, when the wicked kings burned up Jeremiah's scroll, he had to rewrite it. And he did it topically because that's how he remembered it, you know? So mm. it, 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 those, those two things make, a, are, make for challenges for people, especially when they're reading the Bible for the first time. And I think we see that a lot, especially with the objections from atheists. There's there's websites even that go through the Bible to show all the contradictions. And often so a skeptical source might say, oh, see, they got that out of order there. And, and you're saying, but actually, if we really understand the way this was ri- written and meant to be understood, they weren't meaning to communicate chronology like this happened and then this happened and this this happened. And so we can misunderstand. And, and I think that that's an important point to bring out that I've just found in in my study of the Bible that every time it seems like there's a contradiction, it's always because there's something I don't understand. It's an, yeah. it's an ancient book, and so really the error is is with me, not with the Bible. And it's just amazing how even after all these years, things that skeptics thought for so long was a contradiction, then we'll we'll get some archaeological evidence here or something there to show. Oh, actually, that's not a contradiction at all, and here's why. And and yeah. it's just fun seeing how scholarship supports just the the reliability of the Bible. And so one thing I've seen a lot, uh, especially in with, among my generation, in fact, when I grew up and we would do street ministry and evangelism, we would just hand people a New Testament. We would say, here, just read John and, and read the New Testament. And there was almost, I mean, it was never communicated to me that the Old Testament wasn't important, but it was kind of understood, it seemed, that, you know, but you really want to make sure you read the New Testament. And so you're coming along saying, no, the, the Old Testament is incredibly important to read. So when somebody would say that, when they would say, well, I don't really feel like I need to read the Old Testament. I'm a Christian. The gospel is all in the New Testament. What would you say to, to somebody who is bringing up that, that type of idea? Well, first of all, First Corinthians tells us that everything that was written in the Old Testament was written for our instruction and to give us examples of how to live. So that's, that's first. The New Testament tells us to read the Old Testament. Secondly, the uh, Old Testament is quoted all through the New Testament. And if you don't know what it's talking about, you won't understand any of those quotations. You won't understand the context. And third, and most importantly to me, is that the gospel message was proclaimed from Genesis on. It was proclaimed so that people would be able to recognize it when it came, when Jesus came. They would know that he was the one that the prophets were speaking of. And when you look back and you see all the wonderful things that God did, and how he he planted the seeds and foretold what was going to happen with Jesus and what he was doing to bring humans to dwell with him once again. Um, it, it's just so, um, it, it just increases hope, it increases faith. It's, it's just, a, it makes me just want to jump up and down with joy and say, thank you, thank you, God, for all that you did. It's a huge faith increaser. 
Yeah, I, I agree. And as I'm kind of working my way through your study, about a month ago, I started reading the Old Testament again, starting in Genesis, but I'm actually reading it in chronological order. And uh, so I'm, I'm somewhere in Exodus right now. And it, it's really true. It, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of in that, that point that I always if I'm honest, lose interest. You know, they're talking about this loop has to be on this part of the ephod and you know, <laughs> this has to be over here. And, and I know it's important, but I'm just like, I'm trying so hard not to be bored by this, but, but, you know, just little things that, that if you'll read it, if you'll let your eyes come on the words, it, it's, it's amazing what you will, what will be revealed about who God is. Even just this morning, I was reading about how everybody's life was worth the same. It's it, the atonement, t- uh, money that they had to pay. It was all the same for the poor person and for the rich person, which is communicating the value that God places on every life. You know, the the rich people aren't worth more than the poor people. And, And so just little things like that, that get revealed about who God is and just little seeds of that, of like you're saying, the gospel that's being communicated from start to finish in the Bible. And, and so I, and that's one thing I really like about your study is that you, you know, you're studying Genesis three, let's say in chapter one, but really you, you go into the new Testament, you weave it all through to show the bigger picture. And I've noticed that the chapters are sort of subdivided into Jesus. Like chapter one is Jesus, the serpent crusher. Uh, chapter two is Jesus, the sacrifice son. Three is Jesus, the sacrifice lamb. So every chapter is really uh, divided into eras and, and who Jesus is. So wh- why did you just decide to do the study that way? I've read the Bible chronologically several times, and I've done it that way so that I could understand how the pieces fit together. And I made tons of charts. I love charts. I've been making charts since I was like seven years old. I would drive my mom <laughs> crazy, but I love charts. They really helped me to see how things fit together. So when I was thinking about how to write this, I, I wanted to make sure that people saw the flow in history and saw what God revealed at different times, because there are certain times, six times as a matter of fact, when God revealed major parts of his plan. And it was in response to what was going on in history. But he also revealed um, small parts in certain eras and then big parts in other eras. So I started with uh, with Genesis, obviously, and the first thing that uh, the Lord reveals about Jesus, that he would be the serpent crusher, the one who ends evil. Um, and But then showed how um, that thought developed uh, at the different eras. So I divide history into nine eras, six of them in the Old Testament. And so then I go into each of those eras and explain the major events and what God revealed about the serpent and uh, the fight between good and evil in each of those six eras. Then we move into what Jesus revealed, what the uh, apostles afterwards revealed, what it means for us today, and what it, what is going to happen in the end times when God resurrects us and when the battle with um, Satan is is finally completed and finished and uh, evil is done away with. So each of the chapters progresses in that way. And you, you just hinted at this, but you know, when you, I want to come back to you talking about how the gospel is revealed through the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation. So, and I, I suppose a lot of people may not know this, but what is the first revelation about Jesus that we find in the Old Testament? It is in Genesis 3.15, after the uh, man and the woman sinned by eating from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there are, um, the they are given a, a, a punishment, the consequences of what they did, but they are also given help. And the woman was given this very special promise. It's from Genesis 3.15, and I'll read it right from here. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, that's the uh, serpent, the Lord speaking here to the serpent, and between your offspring and her, her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So that's the first message that something is going to be ha- going to be happening in the in the future. And right after that, there's a uh, an animal sacrifice um, that where the Lord takes care of the man and the woman by clothing them from um, 
so that they'll be protected from the elements as they move out. But that's the very first mention. And we find out later through the prophets and through the New Testament that that was a uh, promise about Jesus and about what he's going to do. We will be right back in just a moment to talk more with Jeannie Jones about her wonderful Bible study, Finding Jesus in the Old Testament. And as I talk with Jeannie, I'm just reminded of how important biblical literacy is. It's important that we read and understand and interpret our Bibles properly, but it's so important that we know what it says, that we are getting that information into our minds and that we are hiding it in our hearts. This is something I strive to do every single day is to understand my Bible better, to know more of God's word. And as many of you know, this is so much easier to do in a healthy Christian community. And this is something that Impact 360 gets right. This is something they specialize in. They exist to equip the next generation, not only to know what they believe and why they believe it, but how to live as a whole Christian, as as a Christian that's living in healthy community with other Christians. They have summer experiences. There's the Propel experience and the Immersion experience, which are respectively one week and two weeks of just great training, but also some great fun. So go to impact360.org and check out what Impact 360 has to offer your student. Well, as people read through the Old Testament, and especially with the sort of cultural ideas that we are living among, uh, it it can be very difficult to read certain stories. In fact, I recently read and reviewed Rachel Held Evans' book on the Bible called Inspired. And Uh in the introduction, she writes that when she was a little girl, the book was magic. It just, it sings. And then as she got older and she started reading about Noah's Ark with more mature eyes and about the Canaanite conquest and and things like Abraham uh, being asked by God to sacrifice his son. And and she said that God, who was meant to be the hero of the story, was looking more like the villain as she would read. And so she wrote a blog post uh, about 2014, I think, uh, that it was, where she basically said, I would fail Abraham's test and I bet you would too. And, and she basically argues that it's monstrous for God to ask Abraham to sacrifice his son. And I think she even kind of made the point that by Abraham saying no, you know, by Abraham not doing it, that was the test he passed by, by saying, no, I'm not going to sacrifice my son. And she talks about in her article how she was basing some of these ideas on Peter Enns and his interpretation of the the, the Canaanites, which of course they, they label as genocide, as if that's what it is without even thinking, uh, maybe it wasn't genocide, maybe it was just just judgment or something along those lines, but that, that never gets discussed in that realm. But I, I want to ask you about this in particular, because when she wrote this piece, you wrote a five uh, five part response to her. And it was really in depth. And I just want to encourage anyone listening that if you feel confused at all about ideas like that, when they come up, come about saying, well, that would be evil if God really asked him to do that. So we're going to reinterpret this to where that's not what's actually happening. Uh, I, I would encourage you to go to JeannieJones.net and read her five part response to Rachel Held Evans. And so Jeannie, I'm just going to ask you to Sum, it, sum up for us what you would say to somebody and maybe pull out some things you wrote uh, in response to Rachel Held Evans as well. But what would you say to someone who says, oh my gosh, that, that's so mean of God. God would never do that. God yeah. would never ask Abraham to sacrifice his son. Well, how would you respond? Yeah, this is, this is another case where we don't understand what people uh, were thinking and doing at the time. We don't understand the societies of back then. Um, first of all, in, in Abraham's day, Abraham was living in Ur. And we know now from archaeological finds that human sacrifices were massive in Ur. Uh, but the thing is, because people believe that there were gods controlling um, all the forces of nature. If there was a uh, uh, a drought where the rain hadn't come in a long time, and the food uh, was beginning to be short, uh, they would offer sacrifices to the gods. Now, if the drought continued and a famine began, they would think, oh, we weren't able to get 
the uh, attention of the gods. We've got to try harder. Let's do something more. Let's do something greater. And eventually they turn to human sacrifices. Now, usually, by the way, it was adults, um, not not uh, babies. So that we've, we have found some um, at that point in time, it's mostly adults, though there were some, some babies sacrificed. But the, uh, the thing is, what we don't understand is that anyone in a village that's thinking, you know, my whole family is going to die if uh, we don't get rain soon and so that we can have food. And if somebody says, I volunteer, uh, either myself or, or one of my family members, uh, to be sacrificed in order to save everybody else's life, otherwise we're all going to die, uh, that person was considered a hero. The the uh, adult, if it was a child, was considered a hero. And if it was a um, an adult that was being sacrificed, that person that offered to give his life was considered to be an absolute hero. So in the time that Abraham lived, it was considered honorable to uh, be willing to be sacrificed yourself or to uh, sacrifice a family member. So that's the first thing. It wasn't considered to be a bad thing in his day. It was considered to be something very, very honorable. So Abraham would not have seen it as a, uh, as a moral problem. The, mm. second, the second thing to note on that is that um, when God asked Abraham to uh, to sacrifice Isaac, he had already shown that he was a, that he was um, trustworthy. He uh, he enabled Abraham to defeat uh, four kings who had just carried off uh, the the city where where Abraham's nephew was, uh, and he was able with just three hundred men to defeat the armies of four kings. He had seen angels. He had seen the destruction of Sodom. And Gomorrah, he had uh, most importantly seen the miraculous birth of Isaac after uh, after uh, Sarah was well past menopause and was ninety years old, and so he absolutely and fully believed God could do anything, and he absolutely and fully believed that Isaac was the child of promise because God said he was, and so the New Testament tells us that he believed that. Uh, that uh, God would raise Isaac from the from the dead, and uh, and there does seem to be that because Abraham, when he and Isaac set off, he tells his servants, "We're going to come back to you, both the boy and I." And so that that is a statement of faith that even though he believed, okay, God has told me to sacrifice my son, nonetheless, you know, he's going to raise him from the dead because I know that. Um, that he's the, he's the child of promise and God always keeps his word and he's got all this miraculous ability. So, so he fully, fully trusted that God had prepared him quite a bit. And then the third thing, of course, is that the New Testament tells us that Abraham receiving Isaac back was a type of what was going to happen with Jesus, namely that um, Isaac, because he was a descendant of Adam, was going to die. Anyway, he had a sentence of death already because all humans died after after the fall and the loss of the tree of life. So when Abraham took him and offered him, and then the angel stopped him uh, and he received back his son. Well, Isaac was as good as dead, but he sees the ram and the angel of the Lord says, no, no, take the ram. Take the ram. That's going to be the sacrifice. And so then we see that there's going to be a substitution in order to bring life to Isaac. And, uh, of course, that's uh, represented in, in what happened with Jesus, whereas Jesus gave him of himself in order to bring life to all those who are Abraham's children. And then... Um, the fourth, uh, there, I almost forgot my fourth, uh, my fourth thing that I wanted to say. The angel of the Lord says to Abraham, because you obeyed me and did not hold back your only begotten son, because you obeyed me, therefore your descendants will be as many as, as the, uh, the stars in the sky, and uh, all the nations are going to be able to to come to me. I've forgotten the exact quotation, but the, the main point about it is that uh, 
Those angels of the Lord said specifically, because you obeyed me and did not withhold your only begotten son. And so the the idea that Abraham passed the test by not doing so isn't correct. He passed the test by offering his son. The angel of the Lord stopped him because he didn't want that to go through. And uh, and uh, his obedience all through Scripture is is commended as being uh, being righteous because he had such faith in God. Now, where people worry is they say, "Oh my gosh, you know, what if God?" said something like that today. Well, he won't. And we know that because, first of all, he stopped Abraham. Um, and by stopping Abraham, he was showing uh, the people of other religions, look, my servant trusts me just as much as you trust in your gods. He was willing to sacrifice just as much as you're willing to sacrifice. But I stopped him because I don't want uh, human mm. sacrifice to be going on. In fact, in the Old Testament, it says the human sacrifice that was going on was actually to demons. And then later in the time of Moses, uh, God made it very plain. No children were ever to be sacrificed to any God. Uh, that, mm. that was off the table. So we know with, without a doubt that God has said, uh-uh, I don't want that done. Uh, it's never to happen. And so if somebody says, oh, I think God has told me to sacrifice my children, we know uh -uh, he hasn't. He definitely has not because it conflicts with what the Bible tells us. And also in the Psalms, and this was one of the Psalms of David, David says, no man can give a sacrifice as a ransom for another man. It can't be done. And yet I know that you're going to redeem my life. And we know that how God did it that from that psalm, which was obviously prophetic, we know that uh, God did it through Jesus because Jesus was holy and righteous and was was God come down uh, to, to live as a man. And he was the only one who could give a ransom for another man's life because it's uh, the ransom to bring us life, to bring us into the uh, holy dwelling of 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 God uh, was greater than any any person since all of us have sinned and, and uh, therefore can't ransom ourselves or anybody else. So it's mind blowing to me that when we actually read this story fit in its cultural context, its historical context, and we really understand what was going on, not only is it not monstrous what God did, but it was actually a repudiation of human sacrifice in a yes. way that they would understand. And it was setting up the idea of substitutionary atonement for people to understand the gospel. I mean, what an important story. And, and I think that this is why it's so important for us as we read through the Old Testament, that when something hits me kind of wrong or I go, wow, that sounds mean, I, I always think, okay, I know that God is just, he's perfectly fair. And so I'm not understanding something. There's a deeper thing here going on that I'm going to dig and try to find out. Because honestly, when you read the story, as it was meant to be understood, as it was written, it's beautiful. It's, it's a beautiful picture of who God is and, and what he wants from us, what he doesn't want from us. Yeah. And, and then of course, setting up that, that substitutionary atonement of Jesus in a way that, that those people would understand. Yes. And not only that, the, the way that the story shocks us makes us understand what God and Jesus, what God the Father and Jesus the Son were doing. The first time I read it, it just, uh, the, uh, the Father sacrificing the Son in the Gospel of John, uh, it didn't really mean that much to me because I, I, I kind of thought, oh, well, you know, he's God. He doesn't have feelings. You know, I mean, he seems so big, you know, kind of thing. But then when I read the story, of Abraham and Isaac, and I realized the connection, it made me relate suddenly to the immensity of what uh, our Father, our Heavenly Father had done, and uh, what Jesus had decided to do in giving, giving himself as a type of that Isaac. It was amazing. Yeah. So you mentioned Jesus as a type of Isaac. Uh, you say that the Old Testament reveals Jesus in several ways. Can you explain that? A little sure. further. I actually should have said Isaac was a type of Jesus, but oh, right, <laughs> right. Switch that. Switch it. Right. Yeah. The the, the Old Testament talks about um, Jesus or reveals Jesus in in three ways. One is through promises, such as the promise that we saw to Eve. 
uh, and also through the very various covenant promises, like the one to David, where uh, the Lord said, um, you will have an, an offspring, a seed, whose throne will last forever. And then the second way is through prophecy. And that's when they think of the Old Testament revealing the, the uh, revealing things about Jesus, and prophecy are when um, prophecies are when uh, God reveals to somebody something they wouldn't know by themselves, they wouldn't know naturally, and so God gives certain words. And the most um, famous prophecies, I think, are the ones in Isaiah fifty three, for instance, of, of the the suffering servant who's going to die and and give his life. Um, for for sins, and then uh, so that those are the two main ways through through promises and prophecies. But there's a third way, and this is just amazing, and that is through. Uh, types, or uh, to make it three Ps, it's promises, prophecies, importance. <laughs> but unless mm-hmm. you grew up reading lots of Scottish fairy tales, you probably don't know what important is, <laughs> which is just <laughs> an future institution or person who foreshadows something in the in the future. And the word that scholars use today is, is usually type. It comes from the Greek tupos, which is spelled T-Y-P-O-S. The um, there are lots of types, lots and lots of types in the Old Testament that the New Testament tells us Jesus fulfilled. So we have, uh, in this case, uh, the New Testament tells us that Abraham's sacrifice of um, Isaac and receiving him back was a type of the father's sacrifice of Jesus and raising him from the dead through resurrection. Um, and then we have uh, the Old Testament says that a Messiah was going to come, a king was going to come, and David was a type of that king. And um, that that king was going to be greater than David and, and uh, fully righteous, unlike David. And that king would rule forever, unlike David. In every case, the types uh, foreshadow something. And then that something that they foreshadow is much greater. And so in, this, in, uh, in both of those cases, obviously, what happened uh, through Jesus was much greater than the type in the Old Testament. Now, and and I just want to clarify for anyone listening who might be a little confused uh, if this is the first time you're hearing about types of Jesus in the Old Testament. When when we talk about there being types, we're not saying that the historic stories didn't happen, but that they were just mythological and and types of what would come. Abraham lived. It happened. Adam and Eve lived. (laughs) Those those are, are historical stories, but within their historical context, God revealed things about the gospel and about Jesus. So that's, that's what we mean by types. We're not saying that it's just a metaphor or an allegory or something along those lines. These are, these are real historical stories that we can find types of Jesus in. And uh, so Jeannie, don't scholars say that some people go overboard in finding uh, Old Testament types. There, there's some debate about that. So, so speak to that a little bit. Yes, they do. There, there are have been books written, and uh, some sometimes in the in the early church, people found um, what they thought were types everywhere in the Old Testament, and uh, a lot of scholars have have looked at that and go, uh, I don't know about that. So, what I've done in this book is I've stuck only with the ones that the New Testament says these are types. So the Holy Spirit revealed to the New Testament writers these things in the Old Testament were types of Jesus. So that's yeah. very good because oh. we can go, we can go overboard. Like we can look back yeah. at an old Testament story and, and find our, you know, s- something that is just not even at all what, <laughs> what God yeah, meant to, right. to communicate and, through it. So I, that's a very good point. Uh, another thing about uh, Abraham and Isaac, they were both prophets and God often gave not only words to prophets, he gave them actions. He often told prophets to act out events that were significant, events that would happen later. It happens all through the the Old Testament. Yeah. So uh, you talk about Jesus. One of, one of the uh, sections here talks about Jesus being the Passover lamb. And we say yeah. that a lot, right? In church, yeah. we sing songs about the lamb. And um, But, you know, what does that actually mean? I think sometimes we say these words that we learn in church and it kind of becomes part of our Christianese, but we don't really have it rooted in an understanding of, of where it came from and why we say that. So talk a, a bit about Jesus being the Passover lamb. Sure. You know, when I was uh, 14, somebody gave me a New Testament and I read it through and I thought, Passover lamb, that must be a metaphor for something. But 
later, after I read the Old Testament and started studying it more, I discovered, oh my gosh, it's not a metaphor at all. It's a type. What happened is um, in in the Old Testament times, uh, God told Abraham, the prophet Abraham, that he was going to have a lot of descendants and they were going to be enslaved for 400 years. Uh, And then uh, he was going to take the people out of slavery and bring them to a particular land that he, in Canaan, that God has shown to Abraham. He said, I'm going to give this land to your descendants. Now, everything happened just like Abraham was told the uh, people went to Egypt to live because of a because of a famine. There they started multiplying, and uh, the Egyptians enslaved them so that they wouldn't. If there was a war, they wouldn't be so numerous that they were going to uh, uh, go and join the enemies and uh, fight against them and then run away and not be slaves anymore. And so they started killing off the Hebrew babies, uh, all the sons in order to, to cut back on the, on their numbers and keep them from escaping by being too numerous. And they, they were crying out to God because of their hardships. And in the meantime, God calls Moses, another prophet, and tells him he's to go and lead the people out of, uh, out of slavery and to the land promised to Abraham. And he sends Moses over to, to do this to the people, and he gives them the ability to perform certain signs so that people will know it's really God sending them. And he even, in fact, appears in a theophany to 70 of the elders of, of the uh, Jewish people, of the Hebrews. And so they, um, they, Uh, are all excited and thinking, oh, this is just going to be such a wonderful thing. And then Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, the Lord God says, let my people go that they may worship me. And uh, Pharaoh says, uh, no, and makes a partner on the on the Hebrews. The Hebrews get upset with Moses, <laughs> and things are going really bad. But the Lord says, nope, you keep going back, and certain plagues occur. All of these plagues um, show that the Egyptian gods do not have power, because they were supposed to have power over the sun, power over uh, the river, etc. And uh, the plagues were designed to show that, no, no, it's the Hebrew God was the real God. He's the one with power. And then he announced the 10th plague. And the 10th plague was going to be the um, killing of all the firstborn sons in in Egypt. And uh, Moses told the Hebrews, he says, okay, all of you, here's what God said. You're going to um, need to get dressed and ready to, to leave in a hurry tonight. And you need to sacrifice a lamb, kill a lamb and uh, roast it for dinner. But you need to take the blood and paint it at the top and sides of the doorpost. And then tonight when the destroyer comes, uh, the Lord won't allow the destroyer to kill the firstborn sons of any home that has the blood on the, on the doorpost and the, and the door sides. But everybody else, those in Egypt that haven't done this, their firstborn sons are going to die. And uh, so that night, the destroyer came, the firstborn sons in Egypt all died. Pharaoh calls Moses to him and says, okay, get out of here. Take your people and go worship. Uh, and uh, Moses said, okay, the, and told the people, okay, we're going. Notice that tonight, the angel of the Lord, the destroyer, passed over all the homes of those that had the blood, uh, the, uh, blood of the lamb uh, uh, over their doors, but killed all the others. And now we're going to escape and go to the promised land. And so the Passover lamb, the New Testament tells us, was a uh, was a type of what Jesus was going to do. The, the Passover lamb allowed the people to escape slavery to Egypt and escape that hardship so that they could go and be God's people in the promised land. And, and the New Testament tells us, uh, especially in the, in the Gospel of John, that um, Jesus is the Passover lamb who died so that we can escape slavery to sin and go to be, dwell with God in the heavenly promised land in the new heavens and earth. So it's, it's a pretty neat type. And uh, again... Yeah. Yeah, the 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 fulfillment is always greater than uh, the type that's in the Old Testament. So yeah, not a and, and not a metaphor. It's a type, right? And and once again, we have just such such a strong theme of substitution of Jesus being the substitute for us. 
yes. uh, all throughout scripture from, from, and, and you know, it's when we talk about substitutionary atonement, often people will bicker about new Testament verses, but it's like, just, just go back and read the old Testament. It's all over the place. And, uh, we may not have time to get deep into Isaiah 53. I've spent a bit of time on it in on the podcast and on the blog as well. There's a there's a prophecy about Jesus in Isaiah 53 that it really strongly supports the idea of him being a substitute for us to to bring cleansing for our sin and to take the punishment that we deserved upon himself. And I've, there's an article written by Clark Bates on my blog that actually refutes the progressive Christian idea that uh, it's not about substitutionary atonement in, in some way. So you can check that out if you're listening and you're interested in that. Uh, but I, you mentioned something uh, when you were talking called a theophany. Help For any listeners who are unfamiliar with that term. What's a theophany? Oh, a, a theophany is a uh, word that's not in the Bible, but it describes something we see that's in the Bible. And that is in uh, at various times, uh, especially in the Old Testament, um, God made a manifestation of his special presence uh, in some way. For instance, um, the burning bush, when he spoke to Moses, that, that was a fire that didn't consume the bush. So that was a manifestation of God's presence in a special way. When the tabernacle was dedicated uh, to be used for worship for God, a cloud descended on it, which was a manifestation of God's presence. When God, Moses led the people out of Egypt all the way to the promised land, a cl- pillar of cloud uh, led them the whole way during the day, and it looked like a pillar of fire at night. Uh, and there's a there are human manifestations as well. The Lord appeared to Abraham uh, as as in a human form. Uh, all of these manifestations are called theophanies because they were an appearance of some kind uh, that represented God or that was God, where he man- made God is invisible, he's spirit, but he manifested his presence in a special way that humans would be able to sense with their ears, their eyes, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and these are peppered all throughout the Old Testament, which is, is so, it, that was very exciting for me when I first learned that, because growing up, I didn't know that. I didn't know that sometimes when you see in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, that that's actually a reference to God himself and, and what you're, you know, what you're describing as a theophany, sometimes a Christophany, where it's uh, possibly even Jesus uh, manifesting himself too. And, and it's just kind of a cool thing to, if, if you aren't familiar with, with that word, that that's, there, it's all throughout the Old Testament, you'll find these, these theophanies. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the angel of the Lord is is uh, definitely a, a theophany, so which is really exciting. Yeah, it really is. And so uh, as we close out here, um, w- with all these prophecies that they had in the Old Testament, even starting with the one you talked about with uh, the, the, the serpent crusher in Genesis 3, when, when Jesus is prophesied to come and, and, and you know, God said, I'll put enmity between your seed and and her seed and kind of that first messianic prophecy. And then we have all these prophecies throughout the Old Testament. You would think that the Jews of Jesus day would have immediately recognized him as the Messiah. So why do you think that so many Jews of Jesus day did not recognize him as the Messiah that they were actually expecting? Right. Well, now Messiah comes from uh, the Hebrew for anointed one, just like Christ comes from the Greek for uh, anointed one. The the um, kings that were descended from David were all called anointed ones. Um, so all all of the prophetic words about a, somebody who would be like David, would be a king like David or, or, or the, about an anointed one, were about a Messiah, a king, a future king. But there was also a prophecy uh, from um, that Moses gave about a future prophet who would be like him. So, they, so the people were expecting a Messiah, and they were also expecting a prophet like Moses. That's why when Jesus said, who do the people say I am? And the people say, mm, some of them think you're the, the Christ or the Messiah, the king that's supposed to come. And others said, no, no, he must be the prophet like Moses. Look how he's doing miracles like Moses did. Uh, people didn't know. But if the Isaiah prophecies were all about a suffering, or four of them anyway, the four servant songs were all about a suffering servant. So when Jesus uh, starts to tell the people um, that he must 
that he's going to die, that he's going to, that, that a seed must be planted in the ground and die before it can come forth, and that he may, must be lifted up. The people respond and say, what? What are you talking about? That, that Christ can't die. That Christ is supposed to reign forever. The Messiah said, that can't be. You can't be dying. People didn't realize that the prophet like Moses, the Messiah, the, who's who would reign forever and be fully righteous, and the suffering servant were all the same person. Mm. They were putting it all together. And so that, that caused a lot of of confusion to, to uh, a lot of people. And then he didn't meet their expectations of a, um, of, uh, destroying Rome, uh, fighting against Rome, and putting up another kingdom on this earth, which is what they wanted. And a lot of people that wanted that, uh, were disappointed and, and he didn't meet their expectations. So they went a different way. They looked for somebody else. Yeah. Well, as we come to a close here, what advice would you give to anyone listening? Uh, you know, maybe maybe somebody's inspired and they're saying, you know, I, I need to go back and read through the Old Testament. What what piece of advice would you give them as they open up their Bibles and and read through the Old Testament? I would get a good study Bible because a study Bible is going to give you the historical information you need, and it's also going to give you cross references so that you can look over and see what things happened at the same time. You say you're reading your Bible chronologically. You can do that either with a chronological Bible, or you can do it by using a study Bible and mapping out the pieces pieces yourself. Um, the, I love the uh, two of the Bibles that uh, study Bibles that I absolutely love are the NIV study Bible. Uh, that's an excellent run. I, I read the first version all the way through. The second one, I, unfortunately, I got on Kindle, and so you can't get to all the links. So don't don't buy one on Kindle. And then I I'm reading through the um, new NIV. Uh, biblical theology study Bible right now. That's fabulous too. But get a good study Bible. A lot of my friends use the life application. I like one that does that's not geared towards one denomination or mm-hmm. or thought like that. I, I like to have I like to know what all if if there's four views of something that that godly Christian scholars uh, have differences on. I want to know what all the views are. So, so I tend to choose a study Bible that's going to give me multiple views. But uh, yeah, get a good study Bible and uh, use that to go through. And uh, and of course, I recommend my book, Discovering Jesus in the Old Testament. Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. And I'll add a little bit of a resource here and a little bit of a teaser as well. What I've been doing, I mentioned that I've been reading through the Bible chronologically. And I've been doing that along with the Bible Recap podcast. And so if, if someone's interested, it's, it's a podcast that's hosted by uh, someone named Tara Lee Cobble. And so I, you know, I haven't mentioned anything yet because I really like to thoroughly vet resources before I recommend them. So I've been with Tara Lee all through Genesis and Job, and we're in Exodus now. And so I feel like I've got a good enough handle on what she's bringing to to recommend. I mean, unless she devolves into total heresy by... <laughs> By you know Matthew, I think we're in good hands here. But she's obviously very studied, uh, loves Jesus, very smart, and basically what the Bible recap is is that if you read through the Bible chronologically a little bit every day, and she'll tell you which parts to read every day. She gives a five minute recap every day of like it, sometimes if you're just going, what on earth did I just read? Uh, she's she's very good at keeping the main thing, the main thing, pulling from really good scholarship, and helping you to understand what it was that you just read. And she will actually be a guest on my podcast in March. So I, I can I can pretty heartily recommend that podcast for anyone uh, who's wanting to do that. So so get Jeannie's book, Discovering Jesus in the Old Testament, maybe read through with the Bible recap, and you'll be in really good hands, I think, with both of those resources. So Jeannie, thank you so much for coming on my podcast again. I love the work you're doing. And, uh, and, and of course, your husband, Clay, uh, just such gifts to the body of Christ. So thanks so much for being on the podcast today. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, you can sign up to receive my post by email by going to alisachilders.com and clicking the subscribe button or simply subscribe to the Alisa Childers podcast on iTunes. 